Today, you'll be with me in paradise. It's quite the claim, isn't it? Considering where they are when he says that. It makes me wonder about the word St. Luke is using here, whether it's the same as the word we put there in English. So I looked it up. Turns out the Greek word that Luke uses is paradise, which is a transliteration of the Hebrew word paradise. The Greek word means the same thing as the English word, and so does the Hebrew word. That never happens, by the way. Something interesting, though, the Hebrew word originally meant garden. And in Hebrew eschatological literature, it came to be associated specifically with the Garden of Eden. And that's where it took on the meaning of a perfect, beautiful place of bliss. On this Christ the King Sunday, I often find myself thinking about the meaning of words. Like I said, unlike the word paradise, most words tend to drift in usage over time. Take the word king, for example. Today we apply that word to Jesus, but really our only frame of reference for that word is the king that we have in the fairy tales we were fed growing up, or the Queen of England. Neither of those really fits this circumstance too much. And so as we read Luke's gospel in which Jesus is identified as the king of the Judeans, I have to wonder if we really understand what the people in the story mean by the word king. And as it turns out, that very question seems to be a central theme of Luke's story. The Judean leaders deride Jesus by calling him Messiah. And the Roman soldiers tease him by calling him king. Both of those things are true, but not in the way that either of those groups mean them. Jesus is not the warrior Messiah expected to come and reestablish a sovereign Jewish nation. Neither is he a head of state who commands armies or sets policy. He's not what anyone in those places of power expected. This whole story questions our assumptions. What if everything we mean by these words, by king, power, and glory, and strength, and salvation, what if everything those things mean to us is wrong? The first reading from Jeremiah starts with a warning to the shepherds or leaders who instead of attending to the people, instead of caring for them and keeping them safe, have scattered and destroyed them. Jeremiah is specifically referring to the leaders and the policies that have brought down the wrath of the Babylonians on the people of Judea. People in power who thought they were doing God's will made decisions that led to the defeat and collapse and destruction and exile of the kingdom of Judah. Those decisions were made to protect the power and the sovereignty and the best interests of God's people, but they destroyed it. I can't help but think of the First World War. Leading up to that war, the nations of Europe made alliances and promises of solidarity to protect one another from attack until a single spark and a single declaration of war dragged the whole world into conflict. And then what should have been the war to end all wars instead became the precipitating incident for all the wars to follow. It was in the wake of this supposed war to end all wars that Pope Pius XI established the Feast of the Reign of Christ, or Christ the King Sunday, and placed it here at the end of the liturgical calendar. The idea was that in the midst of the chaos following the war and the succession of toppling European monarchies, he wanted to remind the world here and now, at the end of our church year, that no matter what might be happening around us to the kings and nations and governments of the world, Christ was ultimately in control. And I think of this because it's our very concept of power and control that caused all of that chaos 
to which Pius was responding. It was our ideas about glory and honor and strength that brought about wars and insurrections that shook the earth with the rumble of artillery. Similarly, it was our ideas about those things that crucified Jesus for being neither the Messiah nor the King that we wanted or expected. When the actual good shepherd and righteous branch does show up, it's with these ideas in our heads that we derided him and insulted and crucified him rather than following him. I wonder if it's these shepherds, so to speak, these expectations and principles that guide us that Jeremiah condemns when he says, you have not attended to my people, so I will attend to you. Reading these texts, I have to ask, how much has really changed since Jesus' day? If he were to come among us now, if he were to show up on the evening news, if he were to walk in the door here, would he be lauded as a voice of reason and justice? Or would we still mock, condemn, deride, assassinate, or execute him as a troublemaker, a zealot, a criminal? I wonder, does our culture, our society, even our church, really know God at all? And yet, there is also hope in this story. Because even though the leaders and the priests and the soldiers and the heads of state, all those shepherds, fail to recognize him, there is one who does. And that one is the criminal hanging next to him. Something gives that man hope. Maybe it was the inscription over Jesus' head or the stories he'd heard about this man. Or maybe it was even just the desperation of his position. But in the midst of the worst moment of his life, he places his hope in this hopelessly doomed man. And somehow he's not disappointed. Truly I tell you, Jesus says to him, today, today, you will be with me in paradise. Somehow, in the midst of all of this madness, all this chaos and suffering, Jesus actually shows himself to be a king. Although he's hanging powerless on a cross, the same as the man next to him, he has the power to change the meaning of the word paradise to include crucifixion on a hillside. Paul says that this man, rejected and dying, this is what God looks like. This is the image of the invisible God, he says. Jesus is the true definition of words like King and Messiah. And if that's true, it means all of our definitions are wrong. And so I wonder, what does that mean about all of our ideas about power and strength and glory? What are the implications for us and where we invest our hope, our trust, our attention? There's another word in this story that nobody seems to understand. The Judeans, the Romans, the other criminal, they all use it. They all say to Jesus, save yourself. To them, salvation looks like coming down off the cross. And in a way, it is. But again, not how they expect. When the man hanging next to Jesus asks for help, for salvation, in the story, we see somehow that Jesus saves him. He hangs on the cross still, but he's also rescued, also saved from whatever it was that he was hoping to escape from. The supreme irony of this story is that all the people teasing and shouting and jeering at Jesus in this story are correct, but none of them can see it. No one except this criminal, the word in Greek is an evildoer, condemned to death on a cross. 
I have to wonder, just what is it that causes him to be able to see what nobody else can? How can he look at a fellow condemned man and see hope instead of despair? How does this situation in which he finds himself inspire him to bravery rather than resignation? I'm not sure I have an answer for that. But it does give me hope. Because if he can see hope and power and glory and strength hanging there, if he can see a cross as a throne, then maybe we can too. Think for a moment with me about where we are today, about everything happening around us. What terrifies you? What do you wish you could change? What makes you want to give up? What makes you want to fight? Do you find yourself in this story standing with the Judeans, disappointed and afraid of promises that have never been realized? Or maybe the Romans, desperately trying to protect their way of life and impose order the only way they can. Or how about that other criminal, the jeering one, feeling the nearness of the end and just angry about all of it? As you ponder this, maybe ask yourself, where is the power in our world? Who is strong and who is weak? Where do we see fame and glory? And as you think about that, ask, where is God? Is God in these places or is God somewhere else? If not there, then where? Sometimes it may seem like the world is falling apart around us. At other times, it may feel like we are holding it together by the, nothing less than the strength of our ideals or the might of our militaries or the conviction of our beliefs. I wonder if this story might invite us to consider that maybe what's holding everything together is none of these things, that in fact, maybe those are the things that are tearing it apart. Those are the things that are scattering and destroying us, as they did in Europe a century ago. Which shepherds are we following, and where are they leading us? Paul offers us an alternate vision. According to him, the world is not falling apart, but what is holding it together isn't quite what we think. Our understandings of what the words king and power and glory and strength are might be wrong. But if we are willing to hope in the improbable power of God in Christ, we may yet see that a cross can actually be a throne. That vulnerability can be power. That service can be glory. Even that death can bring life. This world may look at times like an irredeemable mess, but all of it is held together in Christ our head, through whom the world is still and always becoming exactly as God has always desired it to be. It is in this hope that I recognize an opportunity for us to turn away from and to leave behind all the inattentive shepherds that have led us to the brink of destruction. It is in this hope in which we are strengthened with the strength that comes from his glorious power, as Paul says, to hope for something more, to look for paradise, even on the hill of crucifixion. 
As the stones of the temples we've built are toppled, Christ has opened the doors for us that we do not need to stand there and be crushed by them. But instead, that we might escape to the garden that awaits. A garden where, they may, where life may yet thrive. This might look like destruction, but does that word really mean what we think it means? 